So I was watching a news article the other day and I saw this. A kilometre from Moorabbin Airport, a student pilot crashes his helicopter into the roof of a home on Tilden Court in Mentone. Luckily, from this event, no one was killed, but it got me thinking. What loads do engineers need to design structures for? Now, it would be unreasonable to have to design that roof to support the landing of that helicopter. As those loads are really high, it'd make all roofs inefficient. On the other end, we shouldn't design that roof for zero, as there's some design actions that we need to apply to it. And so how do engineers decide the difference between designing the roof to have a helicopter land on it, or that zero force? My name is Brennan, your structural engineer. Now let's get into it. Before we go into the detail of how we find out what loads to apply to the structure, it's important to understand the type of loads that can be applied to a building and how they're defined in different types. So you have vertical forces, tension forces, lateral forces. These are further broken down into different aspects as well. So you have live loads, dead loads, wind loads, earthquake loads, soil loads, hydraulic pressures, snow loads, and even the ponding of water on different parts of the structure. Because there is load variability in these different types of actions, it means that we apply these loads differently to the structure and how much confidence we have in them. Some people have lots of house parties, means you have really high loads, while other people have very sparse furnishings and not have very many people in the building. So we can have great difference in loads. Because as engineers, we have no control about how the occupancy is going to use the buildings. We need some way of approximating what is the highest load can be on that structure to make sure it doesn't fail underneath those actions. So let's break down the different types of loads that can be applied to the building. Now, starting off with dead loads. Dead loads are parts of the structure that have permanently attached to the building, such as the beams, columns, footings, the physical structure around it. There can even be finishings, and even services that are permanently fixed to the structure. So anything that you can't move in and out. Now these are acting in a gravity sense down the building and typically static, they're not moving across the structure. There's no real difference about where they are and how they're applied to the building. There's a smaller statistical amount that we need to apply to these loads to make sure that that structure is not overloaded. So we have a high confidence of what that load is going to be. Where if we go to more of a gravity load such as a live load, these are more dynamic forces. These are people coming in and out of the building. The furniture that you bring into the building, movable aspects of the structure. And these can even be such things as ponding of water. So we've got sagging down of a balcony, water will pond on top of there. And as it's quite dynamic, we have a bigger radius of where those loads can be. And studies have been undertaken to work out how much that load should be. And so we apply a bell curve radius and we go on to the upper end of that bell curve to make sure that we never apply loads beyond that point. And other actions that are quite well known that are more permanently applied to the structure are such things as lateral forces from soil. So if we've got a dig down the side of a building, we need to retain that soil and that soil will apply an additional load to our building that we need to apply those actions for. And we need to design for those actions. As these actions are quite determined, we know what the soil is, we can calculate how much that load would be. And it's not just the soil as well. So if you have a building adjacent to your structure, that load will come down and apply a lateral force to your building. That lateral force is from the pressure of the footings applying a load on the side of your structure. So not only do you need to account for the pressure of that soil, but also potentially any additional surcharge loads from either the building adjacent, or if you have a road or other areas where additional load can be applied. It's important that you design this load correctly because it can lead to quite high forces. Hydraulic pressure is another one that you need to consider, especially when you're digging in basements. This is typically when you go down below the water table. Similar to a boat or a ship, you will get a buoyancy factor that's trying to push the building up. So what does this mean? It means your footings are potentially lighter. So in a stability sense, you may need to add additional load to overcome these buoyancy forces, but also that lower slab. As is this constant pressure pushing the building up, you need to design for those hydraulic forces on the slab. And these forces can get quite high, especially if you're quite a long way below the water table. Snow load is quite self-explanatory and it's really dependent where your building is. If you don't have snow in your area, you don't need to design for it. But if you have a lot of snow, you need to make sure you apply those actions as those loads can get quite high. Again, this is more applied as a live load because it has a high variability between what it could actually be and where the load is actually applied. Now let's move on to other aspects such as our lateral forces that we need to make sure our structure is stable and can resist. Wind forces, as the name suggests, is about what actions the wind applies to your building. Now these will have a number of different effects. First off, you have your overall global stability. So the wind pressure pushes on one side, it also has a suction force on the other. So this is a combined action causing the building to turn over. You need to consider both of them in your global stability sense. When you're designing taller buildings, it becomes even worse. There's potentially crosswind effects from the baffling of the wind around it 
can cause your building to rock backwards and forwards. So it may not be the direct action of the load applied to it, but the secondary actions of rocking the building backwards and forwards, that can be more critical. In addition to this, there's also local area effects that you need to consider on aspects such as your facade and windows. As you have those windows and baffling and different eddies that can occur, a different load applications can be applied and it can lead to quite significantly higher forces than the direct wind load itself. Because we can have these local area effects, we need to make sure we're applying those actions that normally codify about how high you need to design for certain aspects of your facade. Typically in areas such as corners, you will have to design for higher loads because these editors are going to be more actively affecting these locations. So wind can have a lot of different areas effect on your structure. For something like earthquake, there's also critical areas that you need to consider for these ones. Again, these are lateral forces, but they're more repetitive actions more so than the wind. As you've got those repetitive forces, you need to make sure you're designing your structure in such a way that it can reply that load multiple times. So earthquakes are more reliant, especially on smaller structures, about the dynamic behavior of your building and how the building actually shakes backwards and forwards, specifically detailing certain elements to make sure they're overstrength so you don't have instantaneous failures. Now, both wind and earthquake are not something that happens every day. And because of it, we need some way of considering about how high a load do we need to apply for them. So typically there's been studies done in the past where they're doing Monte Carlo surveys and when they're applying the different actions that we've seen in the past and from different analysis is drawing you where the fault lines are in the structure. So they will have different probabilities depending on where you are, your loads will be highly variable. So wind loads such as in Brisbane will be high, but your earthquake loads are quite minimal. Where something in Wellington might have slightly less wind loads, but will have higher design forces for earthquake. So the location of your structure is highly critical based on what lateral forces you need to apply. And even certain locations within certain areas can be applied differently to a structure, especially for earthquake. If you have a building in soft, deep soil, your earthquake loads will be highly amplified, where if it's on a rock, although it's still applying the same earthquake load, it doesn't get that jello action that's amplifying the earthquake forces. So your earthquake forces will be low. So that even depending on what your founding material is, can affect how the structure actually behaves. And again, similar to wind, if you're on top of a hill or an escarpment, those wind loads will be significantly higher then if you're in a valley, location, 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 is what will affect your lateral loads, especially for wind and earthquake. While dead load can be calculated from knowing the self weight and the different elements that are applied to the building, the live load is more of an uncertainty because you don't actually know how the building's got to actually behave. So you need to classify what type of actions and how the building is going to be used to know what load to apply there. So a residential building, they have a very different load aspect than a commercial, or a hospital. And luckily for us, most codes around the world have defined different levels of use case and what load actually needs to be applied to them. So they've done this through many studies and making sure that it's on the upper end. So live load is typically a conservative result. So we can see from this that a roof load has a significantly lower load than the floor load below it. As we know, there's gonna be less people on it, which means that we don't need to apply the same level of live load on a roof as we do on a floor. Otherwise, we severely over-designing certain aspects in our structure. Another aspect of live load as well, especially when you've got a tall building, is the fact that you can use a reduced live load on the lower floors when you're designing the vertical elements. So why is that? Well, you might design the floor for specific live load at each location to make sure that certain floor doesn't overload the structure. But when you've got a stacking of multiple floors on top of each other, you don't need to make sure that each of those floors will have a full live load on them, as the likelihood of that is very low. And it's only the fact that you don't want to make the floor fail is the fact that you've designed for that higher live load. So when you've got enough floors, you can reduce the live loads or certain live loads by half, reducing your vertical load on your structure. So making sure you're considering those aspects. When you've got multiple floors, doing the calculation and working out how much live load reduction you can achieve. There's no point designing those columns or walls on the lower level for higher load that you're never going to see. But now we know the different types of loads that can be applied to the structure. How do we actually combine them into a single element? Well, we need to know the different level of uncertainty that we have for each of them. So if we go to dead load, we have a smaller level of uncertainty. So we have a smaller bell curve, so we can be more confident in those actions. Live loads have a bigger bell curve. So it means that we got less certain about what those actions could be. Wind and earthquake can also be reliant about what actions or type of building it is. And what is the effect of if a failure actually occurs? So you're actually doing a risk-based assessment on those lateral forces. So the more risk and the more impact that you can have on a structure, the higher level of design load that you need to apply to make sure there's not a catastrophic failure. When we're combining them, there's different combinations that we need to apply to bring them into a single element. For example, dead load times 1.3 in Australian code, J 
just to make sure that your structure isn't overloaded under a self-weight condition, or you'll have dead load plus 1.2. Now the factor is reduced because you have a more certainty. Live load plus 1.5. It's because you have a greater level of uncertainty on the live load that you need to amplify it higher. Now that we've gone through the different loads that can be applied to a structure, you should bring your engineering to the next level with this rule of thumb on how to design concrete structures. If you're interested in this important channel, there's two ways that you can do this. You can either become a YouTube member or support through my Patreon. Without the support of my YouTube members and Patreons, this type of content would not be possible. As always, stay safe, keep learning, and I'll see you next week. Bye.